One thing I regret is not having lived in Hamburg for a longer time, but I visited family there recently and had a look at the concert hall there, the Elbphilharmonie, which until recently I never saw up close. And it's interesting because what looks like a quite a minimalistic building turns out to have so many details, one of which is the acoustics, the acoustic paneling, so to speak. The Elbphilharmonie, or Elfi as it's called, has been designed by famous architects Herzog and Demeron, and the acoustics have been supervised by Yasuhia Toyota with the execution of the actual design of the acoustic panels done by a company called one to one And it's these panels I want to talk about and want to recreate their look inside of Houdini today. So let's analyze what we see here. When we look at this, our old friend springs to mind, Voronoi patterns, which I think is the underlying structure we're seeing here. However, we also see a bit more organic shapes, a bit like the individual Voronoi cells have been formed like a tent, which sit on poles. And then finally, you're seeing those horizontal grooves here, which I'm not sure if they're an artifact of a CNC machining that has been left in deliberately, or if the acoustic tiles were actually designed that way, and those grooves have been milled in for a purpose. Anyway, I found this document by the company that executed this design, one to one and when we scroll down this whole document describing their process, we find this tiny image, which kind of describes how those individual cells have been formed. And what we're seeing here, with those gray and red outlines here, is the underlying geometry, which then gets fed into a subdivision to create those smooth, tent-like shapes here. So what we're going to do is create this Voronoi pattern consisting out of those cells here when we look at them on the top and then in a for each loop create this cage geometry which we can then feed into a subdivision to generate the final output. And maybe just maybe we'll export these and render those in Blender. Let's see how that goes. All right once we started up Houdini the first thing I want to drop down is a geo node just like a null containing our geometry which we're going to work and in here the first thing I will be creating is a grid. In this case, I want to get rid of this subdivision here and let's also disable the background grid here. And I want to turn this into a grid of two rows, two columns, which essentially gives me this single quad here. Next, I want to define my Voronoi cells and my Voronoi cells will be defined by a few points which I'll put on this grid here. There are several ways of doing that. One would be the scatter, which tries to uniformly create points on this grid here. And let's dial down their count a bit to say 100 points. And I don't like these parts which have no points in here. And we could try filling these areas by either increasing our relaxation iterations here or by just dialing in the seed until we arrive at something that we like. If you're more inclined to do the point distribution manually here, what you can do is after the grid, attach a spray paint node like this and make sure you have the tool handle selected and then we can paint in those points here. Maybe they're a bit too dense here. Let's dial those back and decrease the spray rate here to, I don't know, 1.0 maybe. And then we can dial in those points here to our liking and just paint them on the surface like so. No matter how we create those points, after that, I wanna use a Voronoi fracture to create those individual Voronoi cells. So the geometry that we want to fracture is this grid, goes into the first slot, and then the points defining our Voronoi cells centers go into the second slot. And then with our scatter node, we can see those cells have a rather uniform appearance. And with our spray paint node, they get a bit more of a diverse look like this. No matter which of those techniques you decide on, now it's time to take those individual cells and create this cage geometry that we've seen in the paper that we can then use to subdivide those individual cells. To do that, I want to use a for each loop that works on each individual Voronoi cell here individually. And I can do that by using the fact that my Voronoi fracture has named those individual cells with a name attribute. So what I'll do is I'll drop down a for each loop the for each named primitive loop, that is, which is just a version of your default for each loop that's set up to iterate through every single piece and it keeps apart those individual pieces by the name attribute. So let's check if that works by on the for each end, clicking single pass here and then scrolling through those individual cells and we can see that those individual cells get isolated and we can work on those individually now. So let's work on this one. Let's just zoom in on here and maybe also display the individual points of that cell. So the first thing I want to do is create intermediate points in here between those individual points here, which I can do by in here in the for each loop using a subdivide node. So that goes in here. And now you can see I created those intermediate points here. For the next steps, I want to work only on the points that are on the outer edge and not the center point here. So let's use a group node and let's call this group outer. 
should be a point group. Let's disable the base group and instead enable include by edges and check unshared edges. Let's wire this in here. And as soon as we click the tool handle, we should be able to see those outer points being selected here. Next, we only want to select each second point, those intermediate points here to be moved up or down to create this cage shape, giving the appearance of a tent like structure. To do that, we'll add a group range node after the group node here. So in here, we'll add a group range, group by range node that goes in here like this. And let's call this one move should be a point group as well. And as our base group, let's use the outer. That's those points we just specified. So we're excluding the center point here. And out of this outer group, I want to select every second point, which I can do by the range filter here. So I want to select one out of every two points, which now selects those points here. For later, I want to also select every second point here. So the points that are blue now I can do that by just copying and pasting this node, wiring it in down here like this. Let's move it over here and let's call this one keep. And I want to do the exact same thing as in our move group here, just offset it by one. So now I selected those corner points here. Next, let's generate this cage for our subdivision surface by using a poly extrude, which will attach after the second group range like this. And in here, I will set up a few things. First, I want to set the distance to extrude this whole cell. Let's go to minus 0 0.5, maybe like this. And then to generate this cage, as we've seen in this image, we need one more cut in here, one more subdivision in here. So let's do that by increasing the division. So now I've got this line here. And now let's shape this. So the points get a similar appearance in that they get smaller towards the bottom. And then after that, let's get those zigzag shape up here. Okay, to squish down these points on the bottom, what we're gonna do here is go to spine control. Let's scroll down here and under the thickness ramp, let's just dial back both of these parameters here and set the control spline to be a B spline up here like this, add another control point in here, maybe like this. And then let's take this last point and just drag it down to a value of 0 0.3. That made sense for me. The center point should be at 0 0.5 and have a value of one. So now we're slowly generating this outer cage for ourselves divisions here. Next, let's take every second point up here and move it down a bit. And for that, we're going to use a transform node. So that goes in after the poly extrude. And we want to only transform the points in the move group. And we'll just move that down along the y axis a bit. So let's just switch the view flag to this and we can see the effect of that looks like this. Now what we could feel tempted to try is already wire in a subdivision here. So let's try doing that subdivision goes in after our transform. Let's just highlight this and maybe set its depth to two. And that's almost what we want. However, these points up here, they stay sharp in our original geometry. And to do that, what we can do or want to do is um, adjust the crease attribute here on those points, but only on those points that should stay sharp, not on those intermediate points. So let's do that. And for that, we need two nodes. One, a group promote to move our keeps group. That's this group we specified here to vertices. So let's do that using a group promote. We want to promote from points to vertices. Let's wire this in after the transform here. And in here, we want to transform the keep group and call it keep again, just middle mouse on this. And we can now see we've got a vertex group that we want to keep good. After that, let's use an attribute create to create this crease weight attribute that we are using in the subdivide node here. And we want to set this to zero everywhere except on those keep points here, where it should be 10 to keep this corner really straight and really sharp. So let's do that by creating a vertex attribute, which we call crease weight has a default value of zero and only on our keep group, we give this a value of 10 like this. Fingers crossed, let's highlight the subdivision and now we can see those corners stay sharp but everything else gets smoothed out. Now we're getting a few display errors here that is because of messed up normals. We can fix those later or we can do that in the loop here, it doesn't matter. Anyway, we're gonna use a normal node, it's this one and just wire that in here. So now we can see those normals have been smoothed. All right, let's save this. And in the for each end node, let's just uncheck the single pass to see how this all looks. When we go over the whole structure here, let's also disable the point display. And we can see that's our base structure here, which already is kind of close. One thing I want to do here to make these creases less drastic and look a bit more organic is first fuse points which are nearby using a fuse node just set to its default settings and then use an attribute blur to blur out the positions a bit. So using an outer blur, smoothing out this whole thing just by increasing the blurring iterations a bit. And after that, we need new normals. So again, let's use a normal node to calculate those. And now we can see we've got a bit of a smoother appearance here.
You could, of course, also use a VDB, so turn this whole geometry into a volume and smooth it out as a volume, which would get rid of some of those artifacts here. But I think for now the look is decent, so let's save that and export it as an Alembic so we can render it in Blender. To do that, I'll right click on our last node here, and it's always good practice to attach a null here. Just call this out so we know that this is our last node here. Right click on it and go save geometry. And then we'll select a folder where to save this in. For example, in here, let's call this one acoustic paneling 01 and then append the .abc suffix to tell Houdini that this is going to be an alembic. Thus, you don't have to select the alembic here, which you can also do, of course, but Houdini just looks at the suffix and decides that, okay, abc means alembic and I'll save it as an alembic. Hit accept and accept and then this is going to get exported. So in Blender, the first thing I'm going to do is a very Blender thing and delete the default cube. I'll also delete the light because I want to use an HDRI for lighting this and not bother with the light. Also, I want to split this, right click here, vertical split to have two windows here, one of which I'll set to be the shader editor. First thing I want to do here for the world is load in an HDR, which I can do by going to add texture, environment texture. I'm going to put that in here and that color out goes into the backgrounds color in like so. And then in here I can open an HDR. Gonna navigate to my folder and in here I'll load up an HDR of a wintry forest. And that's it for now. Gonna go back to object mode here and go to file, import, alembic and load up the alembic file that we just exported. So again, navigating to the folder where I stored it to. I'm gonna get this acoustic paneling in here and that's this. For now, I'll just rotate it upright, just holding down control to snap it to 90 degrees. And then in this object's material properties, I'll click on use nodes to tell Blender to generate those shader nodes here. Okay, in here, I want to do a few things. First, let's maybe save this and then add those grooves, those horizontal grooves from the milling process, which I want to do by using a displacement node. So I'm going to go add. And in this case, I'll search for disp and find the displacement node here, which I'll put down somewhere below my principal shader like this. Okay, displacement out goes into the material displacement input like this. And then as an input for the displacement, I'll use a wave texture. So again, searching for wave gives me this here and I'll take the factor output that is a float out, pipe that into the height and let's switch to either EV where I can see the first effect of this. And I can see this gives me these vertical grooves, which is what I don't want. So in order to fix that, I could either take the cheap route and just rotate my geometry. But in this case, I want to use two nodes. So pressing shift and A and searching for coordinates. That gives me the texture coordinate node, which I will wire into the wave textures vector input and then use another vector rotate node, which goes in between here and which I'll set to Euler to rotate the texture coordinates 90 degrees around the Z axis like this. So entering 90 here gets us this vertical grooves. For the bands, I want to make those bands smaller, which you can do by increasing the scale. So again, the typical misnomer between frequency and scale. So let's just increase the frequency to 40. And then on our displacement node, let's set the scale to 0.01. So really subtle here like this. One more thing I want to do is in my principled BSDF, which defines the overall appearance of this material, dial back the specular a tiny bit to 0.25 and give this thing a base color. In our case, I'm going to use an image texture color goes into the base color here and I will select a concrete texture that I downloaded. It's just this diffuse here and after a bit of waiting, Blender loaded in this, which does not look right. That is because the color space is wrong here. So I'll select input generic sRGB texture for this one instead of the ACES color space. And that looks a bit more correct. Also, this one needs UVs. Again, I will use the texture coordinate node for that. So again, searching for texture coordinate and then wiring the generated coordinates into the vector here gives me this mapping of my concrete texture. And now to scale this, I'll use a multiply node. So again, searching for a math node, in this case, a vector math, which goes in between here, set to multiply, and then multiplying those coordinates by four. So making this texture appear four times on this patch here, and thus scaling it a bit smaller. And finally, I wanna make it a bit brighter using a color correction node, in our case, a brightness and contrast node. So let's select those few nodes here, move them to the side. And in here, let's add a brightness contrast node in here like this. And I'll set the brightness to maybe 0.4 like this, making this a good bit brighter. All right, let's save this and switch to our final viewport rendering, which we can also adjust in here with a camera symbol. I want to set this one to render using cycles. And after a bit of preparation, we can see that image converging. So that is my preview rendering of this acoustic tiled surface. I hope you had fun with this. 
I hope you see that most of the advanced or parametric design techniques are actually not that difficult. And it seems that most of these techniques come back to the few same old suspects, such as here in Houdini, the Voronoi fracturing to generate those Voronoi cells, and then a giant for loop in which we'll take each of those individual cells and modify them to our liking so that they have the appearance of what we planned and what we wanted to. But also something I didn't mention in this case is the research and the idea that goes behind this. Because although the implementation here looks kind of simple and was done quickly, coming up with a plan is one of those things that often gets overlooked in procedural design. And diagrams like this one here really help when you're trying to build a setup that generates those forms that you want it to. So not only is the execution important, but also the planning and the conceptual state. But in other news, water is also wet, so kind of obvious for design. But just keep that in mind. And if you're intrigued in those kinds of techniques and want to learn more or just plainly support us, consider becoming a patron of ours, because it's through our patron that you can access more in-depth courses, courses that deal with one certain topic over the course of more videos, and also you're helping us to be able to run in Tagma the way we do. And to everyone already supporting us, thanks so much. It is through your help that we can do what we do. With a very special thank you going out to Important Looking Pirates, Jellyfish Pictures, The Mill, Method Studios, Electric Theatre, Pixonic, Random42, Rodeo FX, Side FX, Lusion, Styleframe, and Rafik Anadol Studios. Thanks so much for your support. So, as always, don't be shy sharing your artwork. We are very intrigued to see what you cook up. And until next time, it is cheers and goodbye.